After losing a Europa League final, it's always a bit, you know, it hurts, right? It does hurt. But I have to be honest, man, like, it was sort of inevitable. As upset as I was yesterday, and now I've had some time to let the defeat marinate in my mind, it was somewhat inevitable that our season would end like this, especially considering how we went into the game. Right, our form was a bit all over the place. We weren't really playing great football. Our second in the league finish was a little bit deceptive. It was really and truly a false position. Anyone that's watched us play week in, week out will tell you that we don't play like the second best team in the Premier League. Um, we might have some really great attacking talent, but in terms of how we play as a team, we don't necessarily play as a team that you would expect would be second in the league. We basically dropped into the Europa League because we were unable to what get three points, I think, from like five games or something stupid like that. Or maybe one point. I forgot which one it was. Crazy amount in a pretty easy group. If I'm not mistaken, Istanbul went on to get relegated, I think, this season in the Turkish League. If I'm not mistaken, if not, they ended up they ended up really, really you know, low in their um, given league. So it's not as if we like, you know have earned our place in Europa League. We ended up there because we weren't able to compete with the top teams in the Champions League. And I was one of the rare people, rare United fans, that wasn't really excited about us going into the Europa League. I didn't really ascribe to this idea, oh, it's a trophy, Oli just needs one, doesn't matter which one it is. Especially considering of how well we started in the Champions League. It was really, really disappointing how we ended it and we basically got knocked out and then we had to go into the Europa League. I'd much rather we just finish in our group fourth so we wouldn't have to go in it and just, you know, concentrate on the league and actually making us play better football week in, week out. But hey, you can only dream. But then once you're in the Europa League, you actually want to win it, right? And considering the teams that were left, it just made sense. You You would assume... Consider the teams that were left that we would maybe put our best foot forward in the final. You would assume so, innit? it? But that didn't actually happen for some odd reason. And the game was a little bit of a misnomer, to be honest. There's a I've got a screenshot here from Google, and for some reason it has a match highlight recap of like nine minutes, which I think is probably a little bit too long for the actual game itself. I don't even think it was a nine minute. I don't know how they're able to get nine minutes worth of highlights. Maybe a lot of it has to do with the penalties, but. It was a pretty diabolical game. I think Una Emery probably set up and Una Emery set up Villarreal very well. He just ensured that they were hard to beat. He just ensured that they were hard to break down. He basically allowed us. He basically sat deep, allowed us to have the ball on the wings. We couldn't really penetrate them and hurt them with our fullbacks. Luke Shaw is have, having a good season, but he's not exactly a rampaging fullback in a conventional sense. He's not going to take anybody on with dribbles. He kind of uses one-twos and overlapping runs to get past his players, so that's not really going to punish them too tough. Then on the right-hand side, you've got Aaron Wan-Bissaka, who just isn't good enough as an attacking fullback to play for Man United. The same reason why he's not good enough to play for England at the moment. We just have to kind of wake up to the fact that he's never going to improve his attacking output to the level that we need. He still can be a solid right-back option. Maybe he's probably one of the better right-wing backs that exist because he can bomb up and down and make he's solid in a tackle. But in terms of being an actual conventional well, in a modern day fullback that can get up and down the bar line, contribute to play in the midfield or tuck in, in the midfield when, you know, we're, we're, we're pushing people forward. He's not that guy. He just hasn't got the technical ability to do so on the ball. So, you know, Emery's tactics were spot on. He allowed Luke Shaw and Warren Wambasaka and I guess that was Rashford and Greenwood to get the ball on the wings. And then it just, they will just end up doubling up on them, especially Greenwood and Rashford when they got on the ball. But they let Shaw and Aaron Wan-Bissaka kind of have the ball for a while. Then when we got the ball in the middle, they didn't, they didn't basically ha harry and press us on the ball and ensure that our better players couldn't exactly turn and run like the defenders. I don't think Bruno Fernandes had a really particular good game, but again, he's not really the best player. He's not, he's not really a conventional number 10 in my, in my head. I've always said, I see Bruno Fernandes more as an eight a kind of a box-to-boxy type of midfielder, action-packed. He doesn't have the... I, I'd assume... This makes sense. Putting Bruno Fernandes number 10, I would say, is equivalent to playing Frank Lampard number 10. He might be able to do it, but it doesn't necessarily bring out the best in his attributes. It's probably better to have those kind of players rampaging up and, you know, all around the pitch, basically. But then having somebody else that can play that number 10 role, that can kind of receive the ball in, you know, not much space... 
you know, uh, use their body to turn and receive, dribble past players a little bit. You need somebody with good feet and stuff and dribbling abilities. And unfortunately, Bruno Fernandes just doesn't have that. It's not his fault, just is the fact of the matter. So, of course, he'd had a poor game. Then because we had um, Greenwood and Rashford playing the wings, that meant we had to then put Pogba back in a double pivot and he had a pretty d poor game. I think of the midfielders, ironically enough, McTominay probably played the best out of Mc Pogba and, you know, McTominay, yeah. He probably played at the best of those two in double pivot. And people know my thoughts on McTominay. I think he's fairly average. So for him to play that well, this definitely says a lot about the level of performance. And yeah, overall, man, a pretty um, crappy game, really. Um, Villarreal ended up going, for, going ahead on 29 minutes in the first half with a pretty well-taken free kick. If I'm not mistaken, there was a couple mistakes leading up to that free kick, whether it was Eric Bailly giving away the ball or then Paul Pogba, which then led to the free kick. And the free kick itself, a lot of people are complaining about the defending from Lindelof, which I agree with. Lindelof isn't strong enough in the box, but you know you're going you're gonna to get with him. When it comes to one-on-one -on -one duels inside the box, he's always going to lose the battle. Whether, and again, he has the weird thing. You remember there was a time and place where people used to say Chris Morling used to really struggle against um, really aggressive, physical black strikers. That would be like a common joke in the United forums. But I get the feeling with Lindelof, anybody that just gets physical, it doesn't really matter about stature. Anyone that kind of ruffles him and pulls his shirt and kind of gets in his space, he always kind of gets you know, unsettled somewhat. And in the box, when Moreno sort of peeled off from him and was, you know, um, Lindelof was, you know, struggling to get in front of him to block the ball. By that time, it was too late. He just struggled really, really hard. But to be fair, the ball inside the box was superb, superb. Like the, you know, the, the, the shape in it, it sort of bending into the area, fell exactly into the five-yard box. And like I said in the, to somebody I was talking to on Twitter, that was a definitely a free kick that they practiced on the training ground. And then he saw after the game when Rio Ferdinand was analysing it, maybe on, in half time actually, he pointed out that, you know, Moreno made a run from the outside. He looked kind of disinterested. And then I think one of the other players sort of gave him a signal. Then as he ran in to, like, he, as he ran in to break the line, one of the other Villarreal players blocked our defenders, which then led Moreno kind of to, you know, saunter into the box unattended. And by the time Lindelof saw him, it was too late. The ball was already kind of on his foot half while he kind of finished it. And then we ended up getting back um, level second half with a pretty scrappy goal. We didn't really create much. We put good pressure on it, I think, in the second half. Like I said, people like Scott McTominay really stepped up. He had a, a couple of really good runs. And McTominay is another one, too, for me, who I think maybe playing alongside a better DM or playing further up the pitch. I've always said, I think, in front of goal, he probably seems like a really good option to have he has obviously a good strike on him can get in the air really well he's big he's physical but he's not a deep lining playmaker he can't play that role he might be able to spray a couple you know 20 yard balls here and there but in terms of having the passing range of the vision and the you know directness and just to kind of break the lines and stuff he just doesn't have it with his passing so I'd much rather actually have him playing further up again but again that would require our coach having the ability to recognize a player's strengths and create a system that brings out the best in them because I don't think you should really be playing McTominay that deep and expecting him to kind of dictate the game. He's not. But when McTominay kind of took responsibility and picked up the ball and started doing some runs, he looked superb, man. He was really, really good. A um, couple of good dribbles that kind of alleviated some pressure, got us up the pitch a little bit more. But in terms of creating some chances to satisfy the box or in, in front of their goal, non-existent. Bruno Fernandes was terrible. Again, like I said, this probably isn't a game for him. As soon as the team sits deep and limits space, people like Bruno Fernandes don't really succeed. He does that thing as well, which I've noticed where, you know that quick pass that he does where he gets it and just passes it straight away? I've kind of come to the realisation that it might be mostly due to the fact that he's not very press resistant, doesn't really have great pace and can't really dribble that well, right? So because of that, when the ball comes to him, he doesn't want to get tackled and dispossessed. So he's automatically looking for someone to offload the ball to. So it's not even like a, a system. It's not even a way of playing that where he's, you know, trying to craft and engineer the best possible chance. He just wants to get the ball out from his feet so that he can move to space and then get it back again. Do you know that that regard? So it's a little bit, it's a little bit deceptive, the kind of balls that he does straight away around the corner. And usually they don't work. They're usually pretty horrible, those balls as well. And, um... Yesterday was a good example of it. Uh, Paul Pogba was a pretty diabolical too. Gave away the ball a few times. Looked languid in possession. Uh, maybe it was a position he was playing. Maybe it was just him stepping up again. Not so good. And Greenwood, Rashford. Rashford was terrible. 
probably one of his worst games in a while. But if you watch United, you'll know that he plays like that all the time. But more often than not, he gets an assist and a goal and no one really says anything. But Rashford is pretty gash when it comes to playing out on the wing. Dribbling, um, he had no joy against, um, was it Jose Foyt, whatever his name is, from Spurs that they've got on loan, who ended up looking like he had a concussion. He was bleeding from his nose. He had a tampon up his nose. And he still pocketed uh, Rashford the entire game. Um, of course, Greenwood didn't have any joy either on his side. He had a couple of good runs, but not much either. And then, of course, Cavani was feeding on absolute scraps. He had a, a one chance where Luke Shaw cut into the area, looked like he was going to cross it, but he's actually just short, and he tried to divert the, the header back into the goal. Just horrendous, horrendous, horrendous. And mostly, I would say, we always go into games, right, like that, mostly with the idea or mostly with the impression that the only way we're actually going to win is if our better players turn up. And I just don't think that's a good long-term strategy. I don't think Manchester United should be relying on the six players they have at front to really make something out of nothing for us to get back into a game. We don't start off games well. We don't play good football. We don't sustain actual meaningful attack. We keep the ball for keeping the ball's sake. We don't play out the back with any sort of system and idea of what we're doing. Um, it's just a shocking state of events. And one of the things that kind of annoyed me that doesn't make any sense really in the large scheme of things is bringing Harry Maguire and having him included in the, on, in the squad numbers, in the squad. Why was that needed? That's maybe a sign of just how far back we are in terms of a top team. Top teams don't do that. You have to be ruthless. If he's injured and he can't play, just leave him at home or allow him to travel with the team as like, I don't know, whatever it may be. Maybe because it was COVID restrictions, they wanted him to be with the team in case we did lift the trophy. But that's what it is to be in the top team. Sometimes you can't attend the trophy situation because you're injured. But then someone else takes your space in the squad. Why is he even there? It doesn't make any sense. Like he's a chili on the bench just to kind of G the boys up. Like really strange. When it comes to the lineup, I didn't really have any questions towards um, the players that uh, Oli Solskjaer picked in the end. I thought it was a fairly full strength team. Um, if anything... Maybe Twan Zabi could say he was unlucky to not start. But again, I'm not too sure. Van der Beek was never going to start, even though he played really well in his previous game. It was never going to happen. For some reason, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer doesn't rate him. Or for some reason, Ole Solskjaer has this thing where if you're his favourite and he picks you, you're just going to keep picking those guys and that's it. So his rotation is pretty diabolical. So then when it comes to the time where you need to actually include these players, they don't have any rhythm. They don't have any form. They don't have any confidence to actually step in and do a job for you. They don't have it. So that wasn't ever going to happen. So the team sort of picked itself in a way. If anything, then maybe I would have been a bit more, you know, ruthless and took enough Rashford at half time because he was getting absolutely no love on his side, whether it was just his inability to actually dribble past his defender or the defenders really being on game. That wasn't really happening. And then, of course, Greenwood wasn't really affecting the game either on his side. So maybe a rejigging of the players on the pitch, maybe including Ahmad and James, two players that obviously Solskjaer bought and has a lot of confidence in. Maybe playing them instead would have actually worked better. I don't know, man, but whatever we did wasn't necessarily great. I always had the feeling that Villarreal, even though they had less talented players, had a better system than us. They have a better way of playing, I thought, as well. If they had, I always imagined if Villarreal had the same level of position that we had and kind of quote unquote threats to the goal, they would have probably ended up scoring more often than we would have ended up scoring. They just had a system that worked for them, like even the free kick. They clearly had devised a route where they said, you know what, most likely Man United are going to have most possession of the ball mostly. I think if you look at the, the stats, let's see if you can see the stats here. They probably knew we were going to have more position of the ball. But here, look at that position. 61% to uh, Villarreal's uh, 39. And usually when you're playing a Spanish team and you're a UK side, usually it's never like this. Usually the Spanish teams always have really good possession. So for us to have all that possession is definitely um, partly due to the way we play and obviously Villarreal allowing us to have the ball. So clearly they had a, 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 a uh, system in place, a tactics in place where they said, hey, we're going to let them have the ball and if we get a set piece, we're going to make it count. And they did with the set piece that they had. They had another one actually that they did a little bit of a routine with that didn't actually go off well, but you could clearly see that they were banking on counterattacks and set pieces to actually get some goals. And look at even the passing stats. Villarreal 4-5-1 to our 6-9-2. Um, you could definitely see who was kind of trying to play football um, with passing and, you know, possession based and who was actually trying to affect the game in decisive moments, right? When it comes to free kicks and set pieces and all that malarkey and counter attack. So oh, I don't know, man. I think going forward with the future, 
I've never really been a big fan of Oli. I've always thought he was a pretty average coach. I think this is a good example of it. Unfortunately, we're in this position now as United fans where you kind of have to come to the realisation where you have to say to yourself, do you honestly think our f our quality of football will improve if Oli Solskjaer is given a blank checkbook and, and let to sign whoever he wants to sign? Because I don't think so. I don't think if you put Oli as a manager of Man City that they win the league. I think he's that bad of a coach that they want don't win the league. That's what I'm saying. That's the difference that I think it makes. Some people would think differently, but that's the case. But okay, let's get back to reality. Reality is, with the Glazers in charge, we're never going to sign the amount of players that we need to actually revamp this squad. Because I think it's a squad and a team thing. There are players currently playing in that team at the moment who probably don't have no business wearing the Man United shirt at all. So we need a lot of players, not just Sancho, not just Harry Kane. So if you're one of those United fans who think that we're going to be, you know, world beaters if we sign Harry Kane and Jadon Sancho, you are smoking the best crack in the world. That's not going to happen. We need, we need intense help. We need help from the start to the bottom, from the, from the boardroom to the training ground. We need to revamp everything. Um, Oli's coaching like he's if he stays there long term he needs to look at the play the people that he has on his coaching stuff like we need to really level up when it comes to remember Gary Neville saying we need the best in class and then we ended up getting a flipping John Berth who whoever his fucking name is to be the director of football who was who's been there since David Moyes' time at the club right to then be the you know our first foot director of football whatever it may be whatever his role is with his assistant being flipping Darren Fletcher who's got absolutely no experience in the role that is not best in class. That is obviously showing us and myself as a fan that United aren't really serious. We're not really serious about actually trying to achieve greatness and win the big trophies and compete on the big stage. And we know that now because we try to enter the European Super League with the players that we have currently now in that team. We want to enter the European Super League playing the way we played now, losing to Villarreal in the European League final. That's how we went to enter the European, League, the European Super League. Just imagine, just imagine, imagine. So I don't know, man, like no trophies. We finished second, terrible season. I think the second is deceptive. The points tally is probably a better reflection on how the season actually went. Um, the fact that Liverpool and Chelsea basically had a pretty horrible one-off season in their books. They're probably going to come back stronger. Arsenal will have another season under Arteta. Who knows what happens to them? Spurs might go out and get a big name signing of a manager who might revamp them. There's whole other things that are going to affect us position-wise, which we didn't really take advantage of this year. This year could have been the one we could have taken advantage of with COVID, um, with obviously the other, you know, uh, big teams in the league not really stepping up. The lack of competition maybe in the Champions League with, at the really high level. We could have really taken advantage of it and we didn't. We didn't because we're terrible. We're absolutely shocking. And um, anyone I think signings alone was going to change this is really, really delusional. And I... And I wish I could smoke wherever you're on because we are far, far from being a great team again. Like, how far are United from Man City right now at this current moment? Super far, I think. Very, very far away. Like, how many cycles do you think we have to go through until we're actually challenging in a meaningful way? Not like, oh, we're challenging in December. No, actually challenging. How many seasons more do you think? I'll give it maybe four cycles. Like, if we stick with Solskjaer, because I don't want Solskjaer. I want us to get... Because I think... If we're going to have the Glazers in charge and they're not going to spend the money and they're going to um, effectively, every time we qualify for Champions League, I think the season after in that summer, we always spend less money than we did prior. So they spend a lot to get into it. And once we're in it, they don't spend anything. So if that's the case, we're going to need a coach who can do well with a shoestring budget, who can coach players. Maybe a modern day version of what Van Gaal is trying to do. Maybe more expansive. That's what we need. As United, we just need that at the moment because we don't have owners that are willing to heavily invest in a team like all the other big teams are. It's not going to happen. We're not going to sign players at a level that Chelsea do. We're not going to have two players for every position like uh, Man City do. It's not going to happen. It isn't. The guys have proved it over time. Couple of marquee signings to appease the fans to stop the protest. But overall, we're not going to be those teams that go out and sign four, six, seven quality players. It's not going to happen. We're going to sign a couple of marquee signings. Maybe, you know, drop a big load on Sancho. Uh, maybe attempt to sign Harry Kane and then, you know, take it to the last day of the transfer window and, and eventually not get him and then have to get somebody like, I don't know, whatever, some other striker who that we, no one really wanted. I guarantee that's what's going to end up happening. 
So if that's the case, we have to get a coach in who can bring the best out of the players that we have at the moment and coach them into playing a cohesive style of football. Because I think at the moment now, relying on Bruno, relying on Rashford, relying on Martial, relying on Cavani, Pogba, to just turn it on when they want isn't a recipe for, recipe for success. I refuse to say it isn't. It really isn't. But hey, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. Let me know what you think in the comments down below if you're a United fan, how you're feeling. Man, I'm dejected, bruv. I'm dejected because deep down, I just know it's going to take a while for us to ever get back to where we were prior. You know, football's moved on. We're just still languishing behind. We just only recently hired a director of football. Only recently have we got someone in place who's going to spec out the overall, you know, general vision of what we're trying to do as a club and I highlight the kind of players that we want regardless of the coaches that we have maybe specify what type of managers we're looking for only now have we done so only now so what what hope do i honestly think of us going ahead and challenging for the big honors i don't have any hope whatsoever zero zero but anyway what can i do man what can i do probably nothing probably nothing